That is great. All right, well, welcome everyone. Great to see you all here at Clark Street. Thanks for those who are joining us online. Happy Easter to you all. Happy Resurrection Day. And my name's Joe Crummy, and I'm going to be speaking this morning from Matthew 28. But first, a question for you. And I'm just wondering if you've ever been in a situation where a certain phrase is used, and although the words are true, the phrase doesn't actually seem to help. So let me give you an example to see if you can track with me on this. I'm going to use the example of calm down. So I've been in multiple situations. I'll give you some examples. Sometimes with my kids, especially when they were younger. They're much better now. Where there were fights breaking out, and it was chaos, and I come upon the scene, and the first things out of my mouth were, all right, calm down. How do you think that went? They didn't. Thank you, Robin, mother of three children. Much experience. So I, a teacher in the school system and chaos in the classroom and everything, it's like, all right, calm down. And everybody just magically calmed down. Or maybe you're a kid to your parents, and maybe something has happened, and you've, maybe you've broken something, and you can see your parents starting to get a bit upset, and you use those great words. Mom and Dad, just calm down. A, a bit of a role reversal there for some of us, isn't it? <laughs> Lots of different situations. The words are true, but they don't seem to maybe help. And I saw this on a sign that read, nothing in the history of calming down has anyone ever calmed down by being told to calm down. All right. Well, today's reading has a phrase in it that is mentioned twice by two different people that at first glance might seem like maybe not a good calm down, but it actually has truth and power to help us with our past, our present, and our future lives. And I've given you a big hint on the screen about what it is. So let's read Matthew 28 together. And remember the context. Good Friday has just happened. Jesus has died on the cross. He's been buried. The soldiers have been placed to guard the tomb. And Jesus' followers have fled. And it's not a good place to be. And this is where we pick up the story. All right, so Matthew 28, we can read along. We read this, after the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. And can I just say that video when one of them faints is just hilarious. All right, there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. Whew. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead, and he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. And while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. And when the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And the story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations." baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. 
So, I kind of gave away the phrase, didn't I? But hopefully you saw it two times. Do not be afraid. And folks, we have to remember the context when these words were spoken. Because you got to remember, the disciples and these women had been with Jesus for like three years. He had impacted and changed their lives. This Jesus was a miracle worker. Can you tell me, what were some of the miracles that Jesus did? How many people did he feed at one time? 5,000? And another time, how many? I hear a four, I hear a three, I heard a four. I think it was four, plus men, women and children at home. I hope you're, I'm hearing your answers as well. What were some of the miracles, healings Jesus did? Water into wine. I won't say who said that because that might give away something. But anyways, that's interesting. That was the first thing somebody said. What other? Lazarus. Lazarus. He raised the dead. A miracle. Incredible. The blind saw. Those who couldn't hear now could hear. Those who couldn't speak could now speak. Those who had leprosy, Jesus touched them. They were healed. He calmed the storm. He brought teaching that was incredible wisdom with authority that just changed people's lives. He was compassionate and merciful and just the Son of God. Can you imagine the excitement of just living in that every day, going to every village, everywhere? Everyone was healed. I mean, just amazing. And then Jesus dies on the cross. The shock and the horror and the agony and the discouragement and the disillusionment that would come. And in the midst of that grief and sorrow and confusion and chaos, God intervenes and says, do not be afraid. First, the angel of the Lord came down from heaven, went to the tomb. There was a violent earthquake. The stone is rolled away. And I just love this. The angel sat on it, like exclamation <laughs> mark. And his appearance was like lightning, white as snow, and there's like raw power and blinding light. And these professional soldiers who were tough and hardened and trained and experienced and cruel were so afraid they shook and became like dead men. Wow. To me, this shows how brave and bold and faithful these women were who came. And the angel said, do not be afraid. This reminds me of another time an angel had to say to a group of people this exact same phrase. Does anyone remember does that kind of ring a bell of like, hey, an angel, do not be afraid, group of people. Anyone have a guess? Do you remember when that happened? I hear all those online saying Luke chapter 2. I hear you. I hear you. Shepherds. Thank you. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Shepherds. Do you remember? Jesus' birth. Shepherds in the fields. And then all of a sudden, angels singing the glory of the Lord. And what does it say? They were terrified. And in verse 10, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. Whew. It's like bookends of a story, isn't it? Jesus' birth, angels, do not be afraid. Jesus' resurrection, angel, do not be afraid. And the angel says to the women, come and see the empty tomb and go and tell the disciples. And then secondly, Jesus, the women were still afraid, but filled with joy. And suddenly Jesus met them, greetings, and they fell down and worshiped. And Jesus says to them, do not be afraid. All through the Bible, God speaks and God reveals. And when God does that to human beings, men and women, most of the time we read this, they fall down, they're afraid, they're in awe, they're fearful. And either God or an angel says to them, do not be afraid. And folks, this morning, I believe God wants to say to us, for those of you here in person, for those watching online, I believe God wants to say this to kids, teenagers, to Gen Z, millennials, Gen X, boomers, and beyond, all backgrounds, whether you were religious or not growing up, if you a Canadian or you grew up in some other culture or country, Jesus wants to speak this today. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Right in the midst of our chaos, our fear, our worry, our uncertainty, right in the midst of our just normal, ordinary lives, 
Jesus wants to speak to us today. Do not be afraid. And why can Jesus say, do not be afraid? Because Jesus has risen from the dead. Jesus has risen, just as he said. I was just reading my own Bible reading this morning from Mark chapter 10, and at the end of Mark 10, it hit me again. Here's Jesus bringing his disciples, and he says to his disciples, guys, we're going to Jerusalem, and we're going to Jerusalem because I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to be persecuted, I'm going to be spat upon, I'm going to the cross, and three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. No wonder the angel said, he is risen, just as he said. Jesus is true to his words. And Jesus has lived life as a human, fully God, fully man, a life of discomfort and rejection and sorrow and displacement and pain and misunderstanding and abuse and betrayal and death. And as Mark preached so well on Good Friday, it is finished. You can go to ChristCentral.ca to listen to that again. Jesus defeated the enemies of the power of the devil, sin, and death. And his kingdom is now being established, and it's ever increasing. Heaven is invading earth. And Jesus says to his followers, do not be afraid. And folks, this morning, there's good news that Jesus is saying, don't be afraid of your past, don't be afraid of the present, and don't be afraid of the future. And Jesus isn't saying he's going to make, sometimes miraculously take you out of chaos and trials, although sometimes he does, but he says, I'm going to be with you right through them. Because how many of you know that life here on earth is actually really just a series of trials and troubles and tests? <laughs> you get through one, <laughs> and guess what? There's another thing coming. So we don't want to try to escape. If I just get through this, I'll live happily ever after. No, Jesus is with us to face every trial that comes along. Folks, we had troubles before COVID. We have troubles through COVID. And I can predict and prophesy, folks, we're going to have troubles post-COVID. <laughs> but Jesus is saying, don't be afraid. Past, present, future. Why? Because he is risen. All right. And we just take a minute. I just want to speak briefly to, did Jesus really rise from the dead, and then we'll look at some application. Did Jesus really die and live again? So this has been debated now for the last 2,000 years, even to today. And we would say as Christians, yes, Jesus really died. And there, folks, there's evidence outside of the Bible that Jesus lived and died. For example, the Jewish historian Josephus has written, so there's writings outside of the Bible that reveal Jesus lived here on planet Earth. Yes, Jesus was crucified, and guess what? Crucifixion will do this to you. It will kill you. That's the purpose. It's a cruel, horrible death. And the Romans were experts in torture and death. And they made sure he was dead. They knew the signs of when someone died. They even put a spear in his side and out flowed blood and water, showing that death had taken place. And even if he survived the cross, some people are like, well, he just didn't quite die. Folks, he was in a tomb for three days. No water, no food, no medicine. If the cross didn't kill him, the after effects would. We read this, he was dead, he was buried, it's recorded, and there were soldiers on guard, the tomb was sealed. We read this, that the Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled. Isaiah 53, about the suffering servant having to die. Folks, just read Psalm 22. I encourage you this week, just read Psalm 22. There's so many things in Psalm 22 that were written hundreds of years before that were fulfilled in Jesus' death, about his bones being out of joint, about his hands and feet being pierced, about his clothes being divided up. It's all there. They were fulfilled in Christ's death. Some people think, well, the body was stolen by the disciples. We're like, really? His disciples ran away. They abandoned Jesus. Do you think in a couple of days they're going to muster up enough courage to take on the Roman soldiers? I don't think so. Maybe the government stole the body. So there were conspiracy theories about the government 2,000 years ago. Well, if the government stole the body and the rumors started going around that Jesus is alive, wouldn't you just squash those rumors by saying, here's the body? There were eyewitness reports. The women were the first 
eyewitnesses. In, in society 2,000 years ago, there were no credibility for women being witnesses. So if this is a PR stunt, it's a terrible public relations maneuver to start with women being the first to see that Jesus is alive. And yet the Bible is honest and true. There were eyewitnesses like Peter who had abandoned Jesus. Remember, he had betrayed Jesus and denied Jesus three times. And we see this miraculous change in Peter. And along with the other disciples, and most of the disciples and followers of Jesus who had abandoned Jesus now lived for Jesus, and they died for Jesus. And you can't tell me they're all going to die when they know it's a lie. It says that Jesus appeared to over 500 at once in 1 Corinthians 15. And Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 15 about 20 years after the resurrection. And Paul's saying to the folks there, look, there were 500 who saw Jesus at one time. A few have died. Most of them are still alive. So go ask them. Paul wasn't afraid of anything being contradicted. We see this, James, the half-brother of Jesus. You remember back in the Gospels, it says that Jesus' physical brothers and his mother, that they thought Jesus was really like literally out of his mind. And yet, James came to be a follower and a leader in the church. There's all kinds of prophecies fulfilled in Jesus' resurrection from Psalm 16. And as I already said, Jesus predicted and taught this all the way along. They just didn't understand what he was referring to. And I think one of the most powerful things is this. Paul says in that, if you read 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, without the resurrection, Jesus' death was futile. So you just think about everything Mark just preached on Good Friday. If Jesus doesn't get raised from the dead, his sacrifice, his suffering, all of those things are, as Paul says, meaningless. And Paul states this, if Jesus hasn't risen from the dead, we as Christians are to be pitied more than anyone. Why? Because we've made God out to be a liar and we're still dead in our sins. So it kind of takes away the, well, you know, Jesus is a good teacher. We'll just follow a few of his things. Paul saying, if Jesus hasn't risen from the dead, we're even worse off than when we began. Mark spoke on, it is finished. Jesus' death, his blood that he shed on the cross. He is our Passover lamb. He's the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's paid the penalty for our wrongdoing, for our guilt and our shame, and the wrath of God that deserved justice, that someone had to pay the penalty, was satisfied in Jesus. Hallelujah. And we see this great exchange take place, that our guilt is exchanged for forgiveness. Our separation from God and that stain of sin and the power of sin that controlled us is broken. And now we have right standing with God that we are adopted as sons and daughters. We're cleansed. We're made whole. We're given a new life. We're given peace with God both now and in eternity. That's the good news of what it is to be in Christ. It changes everything. Hallelujah. And by accepting the invitation to follow Jesus, another death occurs. Do you know what the other death is? we die. The Bible says we die to our old self and we're raised to start a new life. Do not be afraid. Folks, do not be afraid of your past life. I meet so many people that are so bound up and they're still living in the tomb of their old life. Maybe they come from, you know, not a great family line and they're embarrassed or they're ashamed of what lineage they're from. Maybe they've done things that they're just ashamed of and they just can't forgive themselves. There's so many things. People are still living in the tomb of my past and my past is controlling today and my future. Folks, there's good news. We can have freedom from our past. We don't have to be afraid. It's interesting that when Jesus said to go into all the world making disciples, he says, baptize them. Folks, when we're baptized as followers of Jesus, when we physically go under the water, that represents that we've been buried with Christ. It's as if we were in that tomb for three days with Jesus. When we're buried under the water, it's like our old life is dead. It's a funeral. And when we are raised out of those waters, it's like we've had that resurrection taking place for us. We've been given a new 
life. We've been given a new identity. We've become a new creation in Christ. Hallelujah. We're set free from our past. Hallelujah. We've been forgiven, adopted, given newness of life. We've been raised. We've been united with Christ in his death and in his resurrection. Don't be afraid of your past. Jesus says, do not be afraid. I've dealt with your past. Jesus deals with our present life. Do not be afraid. Jesus says, I am with you. He said to his followers, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm not going to leave you on your own. My Holy Spirit's going to come. He's just like me. He's going to lead you and guide you and fill you and empower you and enable you to live a life that pleases God. Folks, we don't have to do it on our own. I meet so many people today that just fearful uh, of today. Loneliness, feeling lost or insignificant. The Holy Spirit has come. He's your comforter, your counselor, your teacher, your advocate, the one who comes alongside. He gives you the peace of God. Jesus gives us purpose in life. He says, go and make disciples. Make more followers. Extend God's kingdom because I am with you. Go into all the nations, all the people groups, baptize, teach, model, obey, and I am with you to the end. Folks, every Christian has purpose. You might think, I don't have a great job title. I don't even have a job. You might think, oh, I got nothing about me. Folks, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have purpose and direction and meaning in your life. You know what it is? You're to go and make disciples. No matter where you are, what stage of life, what your job is or job isn't, wherever you are, you've got purpose and significance. You never have to wonder, do I have anything to do in life? Yes, you do. You're to go and make disciples. That is for all of us. You've got purpose and significance and focus. Do not be afraid. Go and make disciples. Why? Because I am with you, Jesus says. We don't have to be afraid of the future in closing. We don't have to worry about tomorrow. Whew. And so many of us, we have anxiety and fear about today, about tomorrow, about next week, and what's going to happen next month, the next year, or next decade. What's going to happen in eternity? And Jesus is saying, my followers, my beloved, my sons and daughters, I am with you by my Holy Spirit. Do not be afraid. And Jesus said this, death is the last enemy to be destroyed. And Jesus said, he's coming again. You know, Jesus is coming physically again. And when he comes, whew, death is finally going to be defeated. Right now when we die, this old body goes to the ground. Whether we're cremated or whether we're buried, all right, this physical body, dust. And our spirit, if we're in Christ, goes to Jesus in heaven. And if we're not with Jesus, our spirit goes to hell. And Jesus said when he returns, he's going to give us a new body. He's going to give us a new resurrected body, imperishable, immortal. Hallelujah. That's good news. And we're going to have a new body that we're going to be able to worship God. We're going to be able to be filled with joy and peace and the restoration that Mark talked about on Friday of Garden of Eden, sin, destruction. It is finished. The victory has begun. We'll be culminating in a new heaven and a new earth where God will dwell with his people. Hallelujah. That's good news. There's good news. There'll be no more sin, suffering, sickness, all of those things. Hallelujah. Folks, today, Jesus just wants to say to every person here watching online, do not be afraid. I say it again, do not be afraid. And I just feel the, I don't know what the right word is, the urgency of God. Folks, don't miss out on this good news. Okay? Don't miss out. Don't let your past hold you in bondage to the freedom that comes in being able to to be forgiven and given a new life and you can worship God. Okay, don't let these present struggles okay, prevent you from receiving that Jesus is with us. Don't let fear of the future. And as we were worshiping earlier this morning, just had this 
picture and sense of there are people still living in tombs today. People are still living in tombs of bondage to maybe the past, the present, the future. And today's a day to say that Jesus is risen. And because Jesus is risen, you can rise too and you can come out of those tombs. You can walk in freedom in Christ. You don't have to be afraid anymore. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come and then we're going to give an invitation to respond. And so as Angela comes, and if you're able, why don't we stand and we're going to give some opportunity to respond. We're going to give an invitation to respond to say, you don't need to be afraid today, of past, present, future, because Jesus has risen and that changes everything. So we're going to sing. We're going to sing a powerful song, a declaration of truth. And then we're going to give an opportunity to respond after that song. And in the first meeting, because you know what? It's been hard to respond in COVID. It's been hard. We can't lay hands on people and we can't get close, but we went for it in the first meeting. We just said, like, step out in the aisle, come to the front. And folks, we have people from, like, literally age six to age in their 60s respond to just declare that I'm not going to be afraid anymore. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to receive what Christ has for us. And there's freedom here this morning. So let's work.